Welcome to number six in our series of videos on antennas and propagation. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how to analyze antennas, specifically how to figure out what the pattern is. And we can also look at how to simulate it, and most importantly, how to measure. Now, in some of our previous episodes, we've used some simple dipole antennas and a nano vector network analyzer. And we use that to motivate our study of antennas, specifically dipoles and the E and B fields that those create and how those fields get over to a receiver. And if you've seen our previous episode, you'll recall that we start by computing the transmit power using the transmit voltage divided squared divided by the antenna impedance, uh, here assumed resistive because it's a resonant dipole. And then we ultimately figured out how to determine the electric field strength at some distance D from the transmit antenna. And then ultimately how to figure out the voltage that gets into the receive antenna. But that was all done assuming we know what the antenna gain is. And that antenna gain is a function of how directional it is and also what angle you are away from the antenna. So we've been assuming that we're pretty much broadside to the transmit antenna. Today we're going to go beyond that and look not only at the broadside orientation that you see here, but also at places where the receive antenna is at some angle from the transmit antenna. So we were going to rotate from broadside around to what's actually called in-fire. And knowing how the gain varies depending on that angle, we can produce what are called antenna patterns. But these three things, analysis, simulation, and especially measurements, go together. And as you'll see throughout today's episode, I actually lean a lot toward measurement. I think it's extremely important to not only simulate things, but measure. And we'll look at how we can do that. So here's our topic list. We're actually going to start by just showing a few quick measurements that I did in my home office. And hopefully that'll set the stage and motivate some of the topics we're going to talk about. Then, before we get to simulation, we need to talk about E-fields again and pattern calculations, how the patterns are actually developed by the antennas. We'll get into a little math there, but I'm going to keep it really brief because ultimately all I want to show is what underlies the antenna simulation software so that we can understand how that works and how to use it better. And finally, for those interested in the physics underlying all of this, we're going to talk once more about electric and magnetic fields, like we did in the last video. But let's get into those measurements. What I have set up here are two dipoles. They're each configured to work at 915 megahertz, which is an unlicensed band. I also have a tiny spectrum analyzer here, which you can hopefully see in the inset. And it's currently showing that we're receiving about minus 20 dBm. And this tiny SA is configured uh, to be a transmitter. I've got it set to 0 dBm, so we got about 20 dB of path loss. If I get it as close as possible, how much signal do we get? Well, you can see it right there. Now, if I double the distance, about here, it goes down by about 5 or 6 dB, <clears throat> and that's what we predicted in previous videos. Now I'm going to double it again, hopefully, about there, and it went down another 5 or 6 dB. And that's about one S unit for ham radio people. Now I'll double it one more time. This is all very approximate. Alright, so it did not go down very much that time. And the reason, probably, is because there is this chair here, and there's a piece of metal and we've got some signals reflecting off of it. So this demo is only going to work for close range. This is not a very good antenna range for measurements. But you get the idea. So the measurements did not exactly match the theory, although it's pretty darn close. We did see about 5 dB drop for each doubling of distances. But I wasn't accurately doing the distance doubling, so that could account for something. And also at the end, when this antenna was brought out even farther, this line didn't really drop much. And that's why measurements are so critically important. 
they help us realize that there are things in the real world that don't necessarily match the ideal world of simulations or just what we're thinking in our head. Now, another measurement I did in the home office is to take the receive antenna and rotate it around the transmit antenna. And we'll also briefly show polarization. Right now, both antennas are configured broadside to each other. And that's the maximum for a dipole. But if we rotate one antenna around the other one, like this, you can see it starting to fall off a little bit. Now, if I get far enough such that I'm what's called in fire, the signal virtually goes away. Now, it's a very deep notch, and it's almost impossible to make it go away completely. But you get the idea. It's down 20, 30 dB. I'm going to bring it back and you can just watch. So it very quickly gets off of that null and then it's pretty omnidirectional after that. Okay, last thing, difference in polarization. Right now both of these antennas are horizontal with reference to the floor. If I make one of them vertical like this, You can see the signal will go away if it's exactly what's called cross-polarized with respect to the other one. Okay, so measurements are great, but what if you don't have or don't want to spend the money for instruments like this? Well, of course, we can do simulations, which can give us not only the pattern, but it allows us to look at the input impedance of the antenna as well, or something called SWR, which is related to that, or the more modern term of return loss. All right, now that we've talked a little bit about antenna patterns and how they can be measured, let's take a quick deep dive into how they are actually formed. This is the analysis portion of our three main topics in today's video, and it underlies simulation. So we need to do just a little bit before we get to simulation. And that involves knowing what electric and magnetic fields look like in the near field as well as the far field. Out here in the far field, some distance away from our antenna, the EM fields have turned into plane waves. And those are fairly easy to solve analytically. But what happens close to the antenna is far more complicated. Not only are the electric and magnetic field shapes more complicated, but those near fields may interact with other metals in the vicinity. For example, we may have a Yagi antenna that has a driven element, which is this line right here. But it may have other elements, such as a reflector and several directors, in order to create a nice pattern that we like. And simulation software needs to be able to figure out what those other elements are doing based on the electric and magnetic fields of the driven element interacting with them and setting up currents flowing in them so that they become secondary antennas. And if we do that right, the RF power that goes into the antenna can be focused in one direction, say to the right here, and not have hardly any signal going out in the other direction to the left. But that's all based on what happens here in the near field, near the antenna elements themselves. Now, the good news is I only have two slides on this. This slide and this one. The bad news is uh, these are handwritten. These are my actual notes that I worked from when I was presenting in the class on antennas and microwaves. And since it's a graduate level class, there's a fair amount of math here. And we're not gonna go into that in detail today. If you have the background for this, then I recommend you snapshot a couple of these videos and study it if you want. The main goal is just to get a flavor for how antenna simulation software works, why we have to subdivide our antenna into little tiny pieces, how the currents on those antennas are formed, and ultimately how the far field can be calculated. So here goes. To find the electric and magnetic fields, both near the antenna and far away, we start with currents in the antenna. 
And we've talked before about where those currents come from. We put, apply a voltage source to the antenna at the feed point, and there's some capacitance, and that gets the current set up. So let's assume that we know what those currents are. We'll come back to that. And the way the analysis works, whether you're doing it mathematically, as we're going to do here, or you're doing it in the simulator, we break the antenna into little pieces. In this case, it's a wire antenna, so we're going to break it into little wire segments. So consider a little wire segment here, another one here, another one here, another one here, another one here. Break this down into several segments. Now, the one at the center is shown over here on the right. So what we do is we solve for the fields from a simple element like that. And then we can find out the fields from the entire antenna by summing up the fields from all of the different elements. Now, what am I trying to show in this picture? This is a Cartesian XYZ coordinate system with a spherical coordinate system shown as well. So we've used the XYZ coordinate system before. The spherical is new. It involves describing some point in space, which is a little tiny dot here at the end of my index finger on this little symbol and describing the location of that in terms of the radial distance r, the angle down from the vertical theta, and the angle back from the z-axis here, phi. The current itself, we assume, is sinusoidal, because most of our radio wave sources are essentially sinusoidal. And this line right here in the notes says what I said before. We consider a short wire segment at the origin, as shown, carrying a current, I, and then there's this e to the j omega t thing. Now, I know math is a foreign language unless you've got an undergraduate degree, so I don't expect anybody to follow this unless they do have that background. But for those who do, I'll point out quickly that I here is a phasor, so it has a magnitude and a phase, and e to the j omega t is, of course, cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. And using Maxwell's equations, you can solve for the fields that are produced from this oscillating charge. But I took the easy route and I looked it up in an electromagnetics textbook, woo, or on the internet. And these last two equations here on this page are what we get for the theta-directed field. That's this E field here. Notice it's directed down at an angle. That's because the observation point is not on the z-axis. Everything we've done in other videos, we've been kind of assuming that we're out on the z-axis. Now we're at some angle away from that z-axis. And in the near field, there is an electric field that is pointed in the direction shown here with this arrow e theta. There's also a component of electric field called e sub r, which is radially directed. So let's look at these two big messy equations down here at the bottom for each of those electric field components. And I'm going to do a very quick parsing of this equation, which is to say, let's understand what each of these little pieces of the equation are. So 30 is obviously just a constant. I is the current phasor that we talked about. And all this says is that the field is proportional to the magnitude of the current. L is the length of this little tiny segment of antenna. Beta we'll get to, that's 2 pi over lambda, so it's just another constant. This is beta squared. And then sine theta. So that term's going to be maximum when theta equals 1. And if we come back up to our spherical coordinates, uh, that would mean theta is the angle all the way down here to z, so that would mean our observation point is out on the z-axis. And of course, that's the broadside for the antenna, so that's where it's going to be maximum. So this term says that the E-field is going to be maximum when we're broadside to the antenna. Let's skip this stuff in the brackets for a second. E to the j omega t is just the forcing function. That's our cosine that we talked about, cosine plus j sine. And the last term here is just a phase angle. So in our math classes, we learned that E to the j something is one at an angle of that something. So <clears throat> this term right here is just one. So it doesn't change the magnitude of anything, but it does change the angle of the rest of this stuff. And that angle depends on r, the distance away from the antenna element that we're observing it at. And that phase change with distance is critically important in antenna theory. It is not critically important that you understand this equation. 
I'm just trying to point out some of the main points, like the field being proportional to current, uh, the origin of the broadside versus end fire pattern issue in a dipole, and the fact that the phase changes with distance. And we'll see that in future videos as well. We will not see this equation again. Lastly, before we leave it, however, note that these three terms are different in the sense that they all have a denominator of beta times r. Remember, beta is just a constant. It's 2 pi over lambda. r is the distance away from the antenna that we're observing the fields. So in general, this denominator is a big number. This one is squared. The denominator squared. So if this is a big number, this is a really big number, and this one's cubed, and it's a huge number. The numerators are all 1 with an angle if you have a j, but they're all 1 in magnitude. So the only term of these three that survives in the far field is this first one here. All the others go to 0 because the denominators are huge. That is the key point I wanted to make. And if you'll notice, the e sub r field does not have the first term. It only has the second and third terms, the squared and cubed terms. So this e sub r field goes away in the far field. And for completeness, here's the expression for b sub phi. Looks very similar. The second term here will go away. and We'll just be left with the other pieces. Beta, as I said, is 2 pi over lambda. And hopefully we remember that from the first episode that lambda is the wavelength. C over F. So in summary, in the far field, when these terms go to zero, or more generally are much, much smaller than the first term, then we're left with these two field components. And I'm going to pause here just for a second to let you read through this and think about each of these terms if you wish. The second bullet here talks about what far field actually means now. It means beta times r, 2 pi r over lambda, is much, much greater than 1 for this little current element. So for the current element itself, the far field begins at a distance r, which is much greater than lambda over 6, basically. And in general, for a dipole, by the time you're one or two wavelengths away from it, you're in the far field. If you're dealing with something like a dish antenna, uh, you may need to be a lot farther away to get into the far field. Okay, one last equation before we get on to simulation. And here it is. This one's important because it basically underlies the far field calculations that a simulator does. So over on the left here, I have a dipole antenna. And I shaded a little tiny segment of one rod in that dipole antenna as one of the several current elements that create the far field. And that current element creates fields along the lines of what we've talked about. But we have to sum them all up, the, the fields from this element as well as the next one up and that one and that one and all the ones in the element below in order to find the far field E value or H value or B value. And if you haven't taken calculus, don't let this squiggly line here, integral, scare you. All this is is a fancy summation. That's all integration is. So what are we summing? We're summing all of the portions from all of the individual elements along the antenna. Notice that the antenna, there's a coordinate system here. The center is x equals 0, and it goes out to x equals lambda over 4, and the other direction to minus lambda over 4, because it's a half-wave dipole. And I've drawn this little cosine shape here. That's an assumed current that flows in these elements. So the currents are highest in the center, and they go to zero at the tips, or near zero. Now, that, figuring out what that current shape is is a primary function of simulation software. But once it's solved for those currents, it can compute the far field using mathematics like this. And what is this mathematical expression telling us? Well, the pieces are similar to before, because that's where it came from. And a primary result is that the field varies as 1 over r. This is the r, the distance out away from the antenna that you are. So E field falls off as r grows. The E field is, of course, sinusoidal. But the pattern that's developed depends on the magnitude and phase of 
of the current in each one of these little elements that we broke the antenna down into. And that's all this integral or sum is doing. So for our dipole antenna, I ran a simulation with a program we're going to look at called Easy Neck, and this is the pattern that I got. Notice that the pattern is maximum broadside to the antenna. So for this simulation, the antenna is pretty much oriented as shown here. And by the time we're up 45 degrees or down 45 degrees here, we are reduced in amplitude by almost 5 dB. So the 3 dB point is a little bit before that. So let's call it maybe 40 degrees and minus 40 degrees. So what's the 3 dB beam width? Well, it would be 80 degrees for a dipole antenna, according to this simulation. Now note that the outer circle is labeled 0 dB up here at the top. That's actually 0 dB relative. That does not mean that the antenna has 0 dB gain. The antenna actually has a gain of about 2 dB for a dipole. So this is relative to that 2 dB. So, with that background, let's take a look at some antenna simulation software. If you've never used any antenna simulation software, then this is arguably one of the best programs to start with. It's called EasyNeck. And you can get it from the website down here at the bottom, www.easyneck.com. And it's been around so long they're up, that they're up to version 7. And EasyNeck Pro Plus version 7 is apparently now available for free. So I recently downloaded it uh, from this website. And this is especially good for ham radio people, and especially uh, HF operators, because this software is built on the NEC code, which I think stands for Numerical Electromagnetic Code or something. Um, but it focuses on antennas that are made out of wires. Now, it doesn't mean you can't build surfaces out of wires, but um, the examples I'm going to show you are with wires. There is a tutorial. Here is the link to that. Uh, you can just search for Easy Neck Antenna Software Presentation, April 14th, 2021, on YouTube, and you'll find this. And it's like an hour-long video. Now, we're not going to go into any details on how to use the software here. But I do want to walk you through what we do in our courses uh, when we use this software. In our antennas and microwaves course at the beginning of the semester, students get to build their own dipole antennas at one of several unlicensed frequencies. And here is one of those builds. There's a wooden dowel rod, and a coax terminated in a BNC connector to hook up to test equipment. And then the coax is split out, the shield goes to this element, and the center lead goes to this element. Or maybe it's the other way around, I don't know, because it's covered by some glue here. And on the tips we put little foam pads so that people don't poke their eyes out when they're waving this thing around, and there's other people in the lab. And then we measure things like SWR, or return loss, to make sure the antenna is operating at the correct frequency, and then measure, for example, the pattern. But we also simulate these antennas. So when you launch the Easy Neck simulator, you'll get a window that looks something like this. And you'll need to input information on what the antenna looks like. And you can do that by clicking this tab called Wires. And as I'll show you in a second, uh, this simulation was done with four wires with a total of 20 segments. And once you get the antenna described, you can use some of the buttons over here to look at things like the pattern and the SWR and so forth. So here's SWR, here's the far field pattern plot button. And here is the resulting pattern for this antenna. Now let's take a look at the antenna itself. Remember the center lead of the coax goes to one of these elements and the shield goes to another one. Now, if you're a ham radio person or otherwise into antennas, you may recognize that we didn't talk about a ballon. There's no ballon on this antenna. And what that means is, let's say this upper rod is connected to the center conductor of the signal being fed to the antenna through the coax. That upper rod is going to couple to this lower rod, which is connected to the shield. But the shield is also metal that goes back this way,
And so the center rod is going to couple to that. And this will not act like a perfect dipole. It will not be 75 ohm input impedance or 73 ohm. And it will not have a perfect pattern. So I ran a simulation on this to find out what the pattern would look like and what the impedance would look like. And here's how the antenna was described. And I have to confess to not being an expert on easy neck. So if you see any issues with this, let me know. Apparently there were some issues, segmentation check warnings here. But at least some of that is because I was using a previous free version of the software that didn't allow me to subdivide the thing into enough segments. To describe the antenna, I used four wires. One was a short 10 millimeter wire that went from minus 5 millimeters to 5 millimeters and had a source in the middle of it. And then I connected wires to each of the ends of that, one from 0 0.005 or 5 millimeters out to 0.25 and one from negative 0 0.005 out to negative 0.25. So it looks like the antenna that I was doing here was 0.5 meters long. Wire 4 goes from the connection point of the center lead out a long ways away, 1.25 meters away. And what that wire is describing is this outer shield of the coax. So what I'm basically doing is asking the simulation software to tell me what the impedance of this antenna is and what the pattern is in the case of not having a ballon and having this coupling issue from the element connected to the center lead to the shield that goes back to the signal source. And here's the results. This is the SWR plot. And remember, this is a 0.5 meter dipole. So lambda over 2 is 0.5 meters. So lambda is 1 meter. So this is basically a 300 megahertz antenna. And that's what we see here. Uh, the center frequency is between 200 and 400, and it takes a dip. It goes all the way down to an SWR essentially of 1, and that's at an impedance of 50 ohms. So what this tells me is this antenna is 50 ohms, not 73, and that's because of the lack of ballon. You can move a marker along this curve and actually read out what the impedance is, kind of small on the screen here, but it says 48.4 at 0 0.61 degrees. So it's basically 48 or 50 ohms. How does it know that? Well, you'd have to study the method of moments uh, algorithm. However, uh, we have given some information on how it gets there. It figures out the currents in all of the elements of the antenna. And these red lines here are those currents. So this is kind of your cosine shape that we talked about before. This is representing the coax and currents flowing back on the outer shield of the coax. So that becomes part of the antenna too, part of the radiation pattern, and also these two elements. The currents are no longer balanced between the right element and the left element, and all of that creates a pattern which is distorted somewhat from the pattern that we would have expected for the dipole and saw previously. The good news is this antenna is closer to 50 ohms. That's interesting. And also, it has higher gain than a standard dipole. It has a gain of about 3.6 dBi. And that's because it's somewhat more narrow in the pattern. Okay, so that's a lightning fast introduction to the EasyNeck software, which again, you can get for free. Now, universities sometimes uh, pay for licenses to commercial software so that their students can gain experience with that software. And here is a program called Momentum from a company called Keysight. It used to be Agilent, which used to be Hewlett Packard. And this is a simulation of a broadbanded dipole called a bow tie antenna. The Momentum simulator is sometimes referred to as a two and a half D simulator. It can model things that are surfaces, flat surfaces not just wires like an easy neck. And so the bow tie is this sheet of metal here. And it's presumed to be on a printed circuit board, for example. And when I set up this simulation, I described the antenna as having some metal with air above it and then free space above that. That's what it says here. And then below the metal of the antenna, 
there's a dielectric FR4, and below that is free space. So again, it's on a circuit board. And what you do with the simulator is you do what's called meshing it, which is telling the simulator to subdivide the surface of the metal into smaller pieces. Basically the same thing as what we are doing with the dipole. And then you ask it to solve it, and it can do things like show current plots. This one's done with a color uh, pattern. So there's higher currents here in the center where it's driven, and the currents are on the edges, not really much in the center, and they decrease as you go out. So blue is much less current than green, and green is less current than red, and so forth. The software can, of course, give you things like what the return loss is, or S11 if you're familiar with that. And this one is, again, centered, it looks like, at uh, the same basic frequency in the 300 megahertz range. And here's a Smith chart plot. And finally, the far field pattern. This is a 3D view. You can also get 2D cuts, so you could get patterns like the ones we saw previously. Also did a patch antenna with this software. And here's what that looks like. This is a top view of a printed circuit board. The uh, blue here is ground plane on the back side. This uh, whiter color here is the metal on the top side. This is a 50 ohm trace coming in and then a little matching uh, network on it. And the antenna simulation software can then tell you what the currents are. You can display those currents with colors, but you can also put little arrows on it. And of course, then it can give you the pattern. And this is often used at microwave frequency, so this is at 5.2 gigahertz. Now, again, this is commercial software, so it's not free. It costs some money. This particular one is from a company called Keysight, but there are several other popular programs, HFSS, from a company called ANSYS, and, of course, many, many others. So search the web for available options. But know that they're typically not cheap. Uh, there is a company called Sonnet, S-O-N-N-E-T, that made a free version of one of their programs at one point. I have not looked at it recently. The particular product name here for Keysight Simulator, in this case, is Momentum. That's because it uses a method called Method of Moments to simulate with. If you're interested in how that works, you might go to Wikipedia, as I did. However... Be warned, uh, this article may be too technical for most readers to understand, and that's true of me as well. It's a very short entry in Wikipedia, and like most short things, it kind of assumes you know a lot to begin with. However, if you are mathematically inclined and you're willing to dig into this, this is a multi-page paper written by some people at Syracuse University. And it's pretty readable if you've got an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, for example. I started to read it, but I haven't read the whole thing. But again, you don't need to understand the details of the underlying stuff. What you mainly need to understand is what you have to go through to run the software, which is to mesh it, subdivide it into pieces, tell the simulator to solve for currents, then ask for things like far field plot, etc. And also know the capabilities and limitations of the actual algorithms being used. This is an article from a company called Cadence. And uh, they talk about FDTD simulation software and FEM methods. And these methods get around some of the limitations of the method of moments algorithm. So you can read about it here, which is from this web address. Or you can just search for information on the web on FDTD and FEM methods and electromagnetics. And you can describe and simulate three-dimensional structures with these simulation tools. Recently, we had a project with NASA to put antennas inside a spacesuit so that we could relay biomedical sensor information from anywhere on the body to a radio in the backpack of the suit. And one of our very sharp graduate students uh, was using the Agilent, or Keysight, EM Pro software to do that. And he used both the FDTD method and the FEM method, depending on frequency and the antennas that were used. What made this project interesting 
um, among other things, is that the spacesuits have this thing called a thermomicrometeoroid garment cover, and it's composed of aluminized mylar. So the entire body of the astronaut is covered in aluminized mylar, which, when it's new at least, is radio-opaque. And so when we mount a biosensor on the arm of the astronaut, or the leg, for example, you get a structure something like this, where this is human tissue, uh, skin, and so forth, and here's the antenna mounted on the leg, and then here is the TMG garment that is a radio shield around it. So it looks like coax, and we studied this problem using these software tools. And here is some of the results using the 5.2 gigahertz patch antennas that show how the attenuation varies with distance. But remember, it's always very important to back up your simulations and validate them with measurements. So we actually created a measurement setup here where we could stick a person's arm in and put some antennas on and measure to make sure that the simulator is telling us the right stuff. So I hope that gives you a good flavor for how analysis, simulation, and measurements play together in creating, building, measuring antennas. In our upcoming episodes, uh, we're going to take one more little detour and talk about reflection of EM waves off of surfaces, particularly metal. And we need to do that because to get to what we really want to get to, which is the different antenna types and how they vary in their patterns and directivity gain and impedance and polarization, looking at Yagi antennas and dish antennas and helix antennas and so forth, um, and corner reflectors. In order to do some of that, we need to look at reflection. So we'll do that first. And then later, we might have an episode on counterpoise and balance, what to do about antennas like the one I showed you that have currents coupled back onto the coax. And then finally, uh, phase superposition and beamforming. This is basically how to create highly directional antennas and maybe steer them. So thank you for watching. Um, I hope this wasn't too long. Uh, but wait, there's more if you want it. If not, then I uh, hope to see you in the next episode. All right, so here's uh, what remains. I promised in episode five to talk about E fields and B fields, especially B fields. What is a B field? So if you're interested in that, stick around for a few more minutes. So in episode five, we looked at electric and magnetic fields, or E and B fields. And the electric field is arguably simpler. If you have some charge, then you have these radial E fields pointing out away from that charge, and any other charge brought into its vicinity are either pulled towards it or pushed directly away from it. But the magnetic field is more complicated. Let's say you have a current going up, as shown here, which could be due to the electrons moving in the other direction in a metal wire, for example. In that case, you get a B field curling around it, as shown. And as we discussed, that B field can interact with other charges, for example, charges moving alongside the wire, and that would produce a force going toward the wire. So first you have a current going up, then you have a B field going into the screen, and then you have a force moving to the left. So a lot of 90 degree twists and turns going on here. Now at the macro level, we could consider, for example, two wires. Here's one, and here's another one. And the first one produces a B field around it when a current I1 flows up. And the other one, if a current I2 flows up, the wire is pulled towards the first wire. The second wire is pulled towards the first wire. So there's forces exerted in the direction shown. And that's, of course, due to the electrons moving in this wire experiencing a force in the direction we talked about. So in a sense, this curling around B field looks like a kind of a strange intermediate step to get to a fairly simple solution. Maybe there's a simpler way of explaining what's going on here. Well, it turns out there is if you study electromagnetism and relativity theory at the same time, which you may know are very tightly related subjects. So this slide is based on my understanding 
from some material I read in the Berkeley Physics course on electricity and magnetism. And special relativity deals with things called frames, rest frame. That's where we're just sitting in the room and we have these two wires and the only thing moving are the electrons in the wires. As shown with the arrow here and the E minus that stands for electrons going this way. Now I've shown the magnetic field going around it, but we don't actually need that here to explain the force between the two wires. All we need to do is leverage some concepts from special relativity. All right, let's begin in the rest frame. In the rest frame, in this wire on the left, there are electrons moving down and there are stationary positive charges. Those are the atoms in the metal. These are the free electrons in the metal. So in this reference plane, at all times, the negative charges exactly balance the positive charges. And so there is no electric field from this wire. Now the same is true of the wire on the right. Let's assume these electrons are moving as well in the same direction with the same velocity so the currents are the same. I1 and I2 are the same. Now let's shift viewpoints. Let's follow along with the electrons on the right hand side that are moving down and consider what we see from that reference plane. So we have a new reference plane that's moving along with these electrons. In that reference frame, we see electrons over here moving at the same speed. So we have negative charges over here. And so the wires should repel each other. But there are also positive charges over here. <clears throat> so the electrons should attract to those positive charges. But in the reference plane of the electrons, these electrons are stationary as seen from the right, whereas these positive charges are now moving in the direction indicated by the current I. And according to what I understand from the book and their discussion, with length dilation, now in relativity theory when you have stuff moving, the length can shorten up. And so these positive charges become more concentrated. So as seen from the electrons in the right hand side, we have now more positive charge than we have negative charge. And so positive and negatives attract and the wires move together. So, is the B-field force just Coulomb's law plus some special relativity theory? If you have thoughts on that, uh, leave them below in the comments. A companion question is, what is an electromagnetic field? Well, the magnetic field alone comes from constantly moving charges if the current is DC. But an electromagnetic field comes from AC currents which, seen from another point of view, are accelerating charges. And we overviewed some of the math on that from Maxwell's equations in the last episode, and we got these expressions for the electric and magnetic fields. And notice that, again, the B field is pretty much the same as the electric field. It's just scaled in magnitude. They're totally in phase. And the scaling in magnitude is really just a function of the units that we use in our conceptualization of these things. So in a sense, I would argue that the electromagnetic field is not a electric and magnetic field that interact with each other, but rather it is just a thing called the electromagnetic field. So again, if you have thoughts on that, um, leave them below in the comments. It would be interesting. And I'll leave you with two other things to investigate if you're interested in this physics behind the stuff. One is the Jules-Bernoulli equation which I found in Wikipedia. There's this nice drawing here. Uh, here's, I'm going to call them Sam and Sally. Sam is in a reference plane where a charge Q is stationary, and so Sam only sees an electric field. Meanwhile, Sally is moving in a moving uh, reference frame with respect to Sam, and so she's moving in this direction, so she sees this charge moving in the opposite direction as shown in this diagram and she sees both an electric field and a magnetic field. So the magnetic field clearly depends on what reference frame you're in. And if you want to learn more about that, you could go to the Wikipedia entry for this. And as we said on the last slide, the electromagnetic field comes from accelerating charges, not just moving charges. And there's some good animation graphics to give a sense of what those fields look like as the charges accelerate you can uh, search for Understanding Electromagnetic Radiation 
ICT number five. That's on YouTube. It's not the same level of mathematics and engineering that we're talking about in this series, but I think they do have a very nice graphic, at least at this point here, somewhere around four minutes and eight seconds in. So have a look if you're interested. All right, that really is it. Thanks for watching again uh, all the way to the end if you got to this point. If you didn't, you're not hearing me. Anyway, um, hope to see you in the next episode, episode, what is it, seven maybe, where the plan is to talk about reflections of electromagnetic waves, again, mainly from metal surfaces. But metal surfaces are everywhere in environments, and they get reflected from wooden surfaces and other materials too. So we'll have a look at some of those issues. All right, thanks. Bye.